lucky to have with us today, Dr. Marianne Mason. She is an assistant professor of translation and interpreting studies, specializing in Spanish so that works, yes. yeah. uh, at James Madison University in Virginia. Uh, her research interests include language and the law, or forensic linguistics, discourse and conversation analysis, pragmatics, applied linguistics, and technology enhanced learning. She is the author of the 2008 book Courtroom <coughs> Interpreting as well as the co-editor of the forthcoming work, The Discourse of Police Interviews, with funding from the American Council of Learned Societies, ACLS, uh, she's a fellow for 2018, congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Professor Mason is currently working on a project entitled Language at the Center of the American Justice System, and we're lucky to have her uh, share some of this research with us today. Um, in this presentation, uh, Professor Mason examines legal institutions, historical interpretation, and enforcement of linguistic actions invoking constitutional rights, layperson's knowledge of how discourse is used to achieve linguistic goals in institutional settings, and the effect of Miranda case law on police layperson custodial exchanges. Uh, very high tension kind of situation, so yes. very excited to <laughs> you illuminate that for us. Um, and uh, this, this talk today is part of the uh, Global Language Justice, or one of, one of the affiliates at least for ICLS and its multifarious activities, uh, is the Global Language Justice Initiative, um, which is a, an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation initiative. Uh, Sawyer Seminar is the name to search for that. Um, and it's an initiative that takes language justice as the humanistic equivalent of environmental justice responds with a sense of urgency to the simultaneity of the rapid dwindling of linguistic diversity and endangered biodiversity. <coughs> so I'm lucky to have these very kaleidoscopic yes. kind of approach, and we're very interested in bringing uh, criminal justice and law um, issues into uh, the work that we're doing. Um, and so that's, uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Mason. <laughs> and we'll have a Q&A session. Yes, afterwards. absolutely. Okay. Yes. Well, I have a couple of people to thank. I would like to thank the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia University, Sarah Monks, Assistant Director of the Institute, the Director, Lydia Liu, Interim Director, Anna Rao, uh, Amy Zhang, <laughs> Graduate Fellow of the ICLS Global Language, uh, Language Institute for moderating this event, and I need Guy Guli, Director, Society of Fellows and Hyman Center for facilitating my affiliation here at the Institute. Being a visiting scholar at the ICLS, as well as the Center for Access to Justice, College of Law, Georgia State University, this spring has allowed me to complete my American Council of Learned Societies funded research, Language at the Center of the American Justice System. Thank you also for being here and letting me share my project and research with you. As Amy uh, mentioned, uh, to give you a little bit of background about myself, <laughs> I am a professor of linguistics and translation interpretation at James Madison University. My interest in forensic linguistics started while working on my dissertation many, many years ago. <laughs> I was able to obtain transcripts from wiretaps of the Cali Cartel, the Rodriguez Orejuela brothers, which are featured in Netflix series Narcos, so some of you might have seen them. Later in my career, I obtained data from the bilingual courtroom and then researched police interrogations later on the last two working with appellate criminal defense lawyers in Atlanta. My present ACLS research and upcoming edited volume, The Discourse of Police Interviews, focuses on police laypersons exchanges in the United States and abroad. So the book has people from Belgium, the Netherlands, the UK, Australia, etc., and examines multiple approaches to an interviewing and interrogations. Of note, I have a number of slides, so I hope to get through them all. I think I will. I have used a larger font in many of the slides to focus your attention on that and that those are important areas and I have excerpts from actual cases that I worked on and also case law so that you can see that. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background first of what is it that I do in my field which is forensic linguistics. This will frame the analysis. Forensic linguistics or legal linguistics or language of the law, takes many names, is the application of linguistic knowledge methods and insights to the forensic context of law, language, crime investigation, trial, and judicial procedure. It is a branch of applied linguistics. So for those of you who have studied linguistics or uh, even anthropology and anthropological linguistics too, these would be the applied areas. The police interview 
and this would be in that sort of within the uh, applied linguistic field as work as well is an area that I specialize in and is within the area of discourse analysis. It falls in that. Also, it can be studied in phonetics and in other areas depending on what you're looking at, but I specialize in the discourse analysis aspects of it. It is a type of discourse that is investigated in language and the law. And, as Baldwin notes, and I like this quote, the police interview is an essential component of the construction of proof in the investigation and prosecution of a crime. Now, where did this all happen, this police layperson exchange or interview? Well, it happens in the context of institutional talk, which is task-related and involves at least one participant who represents a formal organization, in this case the police. There's often inequivalencies of knowledge between those interactants, such as police and lay actors. And I actually want to point something that was mentioned to me in my presentation one of the presentations that I made this semester. And someone asked me about power, because I tended to focus the analysis on asymmetries and inequivalencies of knowledge. So I want to point out that it is true that in these types of exchanges, asymmetrical ones, power can be asserted in the discourse exchange, such as in the case of a police interrogation. But power is accomplished at a structural, institutional level. During a discursive exchange, power is negotiated between the participants at an interactional level. So the suspect can assert power as well by providing information or not. Still, suspects are as lay persons, and this is the part that's very key, they are lay persons. Um, and in the case of invoking counsel, which is something that I'm going to discuss, of course, in this presentation, you're going to see how that lack of knowledge between those interactants is worth the key to this presentation that I'm going to talk in the topic of the presentation. Thank you. So the asymmetry of knowledge between the participants, not just the power police can assert over the suspect with the backing of the institution, but it's what the police know that the suspect, on average, does not know. That is where the issue is. So that's what's very difficult to overcome. Okay. So I just wanted to say that because I think it's a valid point when she asked about power. I was focusing on asymmetries and I wanted to explain why because I'm focusing on them being lay persons. The police, the suspect is a lay person. Just like if any of us would go to a police station, we are lay persons. <laughs> okay. Now, inequivalencies in knowledge is an essential component of understanding lay and professional interaction in custodial settings. The manner in which suspects invoke counsel and how police interrogators and in court justices interpret such invocations will show the differences in procedural and professional roles and knowledge between lay and institutional actors. Now, what is the focus of my ACS funded investigation? And I know I have a lot of content here and that's why I wanted to put some things in the bigger font so that you can focus on that. So my research project examines legal institutions' historical interpretation and enforcement of linguistic actions invoking constitutional rights, such as the right to counsel and silence, laypersons' knowledge of how discourse is used to achieve linguistic goals in institutional settings, and the effect of Miranda case law on police layperson custodial exchanges. The latter is the focus of the presentation. Okay. So why is invoking counsel a legal quandary? Because you might say, well, you know, I invoke counsel, you know, it's not really that big of an issue. Everything should go smoothly, right? No. <laughs> it does not. So let's give a little bit of legal precedence. The Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment pro protects criminal defendants from having to testify if they may incriminate themselves through testimony. And you are one of our students of law, so you probably have discussed all of this. A witness may plead the fifth and not answer if the witness believes answering the question may be self-incriminatory. Now, this case is very important because this is that landmark case of Miranda versus Arizona. And I want you to focus on Justice Stevens' quote there because I'm going to make a point of that in a second. But if, if police interrogation, let's say in a police interrogation study, if law enforcement fails to honor the safeguards of Miranda, courts, in theory, will often suppress any statements by the suspect because it violates their Fifth Amendment rights and the protections that Miranda gives. But what constitutes waiving a right? 
Is this simply not invoking the right to silence and or counsel correctly? Is this talking with the officers? Is it saying it at a specific time, pre or post waiver, which I will talk about? These are all the questions. And here, you see what Justice Stevens says. He noted this in Arizona versus Robertson, referring to Miranda. He says, as we have stressed on numerous occasions, one of the principal advantages of Miranda is the ease and clarity of this application. Well, not so much, Justice Stevens. Justice Stevens, not really. You're incorrect on that. Because it never defines Miranda, nor later Edwards, which I will discuss in a second, so you can see that one, which was the extra layer that was added to the Miranda warning, which was all intended to protect your Fifth Amendment right. None of them define what it is to have a clear invocation of counsel, or a valid one, for that matter. So I'm going to let you just look at that very quickly, so you can see Edwards. This was basically a decision from the United States Supreme Court that held that once a defendant invoked his Fifth Amendment right to counsel, police must cease custodial interrogation until, until he himself initiates further exchanges with the police. Miranda doesn't discuss anything about initiating further exchanges. It just says, when the person invokes counsel, all police interrogation must cease. But then, because of the fear that some justices in the court had that interrogation in itself is coercive, they said, you know, we need to add an additional layer of protection. So they added Edwards. And basically, this is what they tried to do. They tried to say, if they invoke counsel, unless that person starts talking to the police again, it all has to cease. But that unless the suspect initiates conversations with the police again is actually something that I'm going to show you that can be very easily forgotten by the police. <laughs> okay. So these are the main points of Edwards. A natural waiver occurs when the suspect has made the waiver knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. So I want you to, I'm gonna focus in this talk on the intelligently, and the voluntary. And I'm going to discuss a little bit, I'm going to show you some excerpts from actual cases, but you're going to see how this actually works in interaction, because it's a little bit more interesting that way. Now, what are the safeguards in Miranda and Edwards that are in practice and as observed in linguistic exchanges between police and suspects problematic? Those three points, and the last two being the key to the discussion. So, the number one question, is the interrogation custodial? So one of the things that they look at is, when did this happen? Did it happen when <coughs> the person invoked counsel at the beginning of the interrogation? Did it happen the invoking of counsel in the middle of the interrogation? All of these are questions that are going to be key to determining the interrogation being custodial, the pre waiver the post waiver I'm going to be talking about all of that. So, the determination of whether an interrogation is custodial for purposes of Miranda involves two distinct inquiries. First, what were the circumstances surrounding the interrogation? And second, given those circumstances, would a reasonable person have felt he or she was not at liberty to terminate the interrogation and leave? This timing, as I will show you in some excerpts, is key as to whether an invocation will be acknowledged by the police, because they do not acknowledge it at many times, as I will show you. Since the Miranda ruling, the courts have narrowed the scope of what constitutes interrogation while in custody. Let's look at some legal precedents and excerpts from data regarding the booking question and being in custody. This is key. I must note that more contemporary rulings seem to consider custody in a broader sense, but that all depends on your, the jurisdiction of the police department. It all depends on the police officers at the time, so there's a lot of variation with this. So this is one of the key rulings that, for the booking exception. Now, why is this important? Because if you're in custody, and I saw this in many cases that I worked on, the person might go counsel prior to technically being in custody. And this is what's called the booking exception. So you basically go to the police station, and they're asking you what they call the paperwork phase. So they ask you about, you know, what's your name? Where do you live? General questions. The person starts answering, but they are at the police station, so they feel, well, I'm under arrest, I'm in custody, so I must be, you know, being interrogated, being interviewed by the police. Well, the problem with that is that if 
the justice, let's say this case goes to appeal, because most of the cases won't be appealed and this will never be discussed. But if it goes, the justice could say, well, that person, yeah, they might have, uh, the invocation really doesn't count because of the booking exception, they were not really being interrogated. It happened before the interrogation phase. It happened during the paperwork phase. And I saw that in a case that I worked on. Then they considered it being, they excluded it. They said that invocation does not count because it happened during the wrong time. And that's really, yes, all these things happen. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to show you another one. This is Pennsylvania versus Muniz. There's, as I said, there's a couple of ways that this has been interpreted. There are many, many cases. I'm looking at thousands of cases. So you have to read through all of them, and you see, depending on the justices, their background, if they're liberal, if they're moderate, if they're conservative, it goes usually that way, liberal and conservative, depending on how they see the, the same question. Okay, so I want to focus your attention on what is noted here, and uh, I try to use the larger font, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of information, so it can get a little bit dense, I know, but uh, that's why I wanted to use the larger font, so that you can focus your attention on that aspect of the uh, slide. So Justice Brennan joined Justice O'Connor. You probably remember some of these justices. They have this from somewhere ago. Justice Scalia, Justice Kennedy, we've heard of all of them. They concluded that Muniz's responses to the booking questions were not testimonial and therefore do not warrant application of the privilege. He invoked counsel, but it's the bad timing issue that came into play in this room. And they were just aimed at securing biographical data, because that's what they do. That booking phase is just about asking you general questions. Okay. Then we have the dissenting opinion, uh, opinion by Justice Marshall. And this is a very good opinion, but as I said, again, it depends on whether the, the perspective of the justice, whether they're conservative, whether they're liberal. So let's, let's look at this opinion, and I want you to focus again on, what's on the larger font. So why is this relevant to the invocation of counsel issue? The question, what constitutes custodial interrogation? And this is particularly important for the Miranda ruling and spirit for which the safeguard was created. Because suspects may invoke their right to counsel while in custody, but during that booking phase that I've just been talking about, and only can questions during this phase be incriminating, and that's what he is responding to right here, Justice Marshall, but also if the invocation is dismissed because the police deem it as happening outside of custodial interrogation, the bad timing that I keep referring to, the suspect may waive his or her rights and provide information or a confession during his or her exchanges with the police, an issue that has repercussions on the Edwards ruling as well. Because what happens sometimes is that the person invokes, he or she is ignored. They do not know that they have not invoked the right to counsel. They think, oh, well, maybe I don't have the right. I've invoked it, they've ignored me, no one is saying anything. The police keeps talking to you, they keep talking to you. And then what happens? They then initiate conversation with the police. So that's where the Edward issue comes into play. Because you have invoked your right, but because it has not been accepted as deemed unequivocal, is considered bad timing or equivocal, or some other things, and I will be discussing that in a moment, bad timing issues, then the person gives information. They will start talking to the police. And that's where both Miranda and Edward, which are supposed to be your rights, your rights to not self-incriminate yourself, then become no, basically. They just forgot me. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about that, about the police and why this happens, etc. But I just want to lay the foundation here. It's basically a dance between the police and the suspect. So this is actually a case that I worked on, um, and this occurs during that pre-waiver. So this is that booking phase that I talked to you about. So this person who was brought to the police station in a squad car, so he had Think about you in that situation. You think, I'm under arrest, right? Okay. So you understand that you're in custody. What? I'm on arrest? He was very confused, of course. He was very scared. You could hear it in his voice. And he said, uh, what am I on arrest for? You're charged with rape. They're not saying you're arrest. See how also the vocabulary, because if you're under arrest, you have to be read your rights. So he says, oh, you're charged with rape. And he says, I didn't rape nobody. I'm charged with rape. Oh, man. And then he says, can I get a lawyer? Listen, we gotta do a little bit of paperwork. And I see that over and over in many cases that I have worked on. This was actually from Superior Court in Gwinnett County, which is one of the areas of Metro Atlanta, suburbs of Metro Atlanta. 
and they actually ruled this invocation during the booking phase, and the judge in that case said that it was Miranda exempt because it occurred during the booking phase. This uh, suspect actually asked, you know, to talk to his mother. Can I talk to my mother? They keep because this is not uncommon. They will ask, can I talk to anybody? Because what is going on? He's asking, but he's not getting a response. Like, okay, yeah, you have a right to an attorney. So he's keeps getting ignored, and they keep saying, oh, we gotta do this, we gotta ask you that. And they went back to asking him the same things that he had been asking for. Where do you live? What is your name? All these things are obviously violations, but the law lets you get around that, and that's why the police do this. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, and I think I have another example. This is a post waiver one from another actual case that I worked on. I changed all the names because, of course, confidentiality. But here you see where the rights, they just read the rights, and he said, understanding these rights, do you wish to speak with us? And there's a section where you need to initial, because that happens sometimes. They give you a form, and you have to initial it and say yes or no, and you have to put your initials next to it. So all of this was happening in this interrogation. And then he says, this is also in the state of Georgia, he says, can I get an attorney? And look what the tech, huh? I want to get an attorney. Here's the way it works, dude. If you get an attorney, and that was very, the tone of the voice, and I wish I could have put it here so you could have heard it, but because of confidentiality, I couldn't play the recording of the, of the interrogation. But basically, he's just telling him, this is not our voice. You're not going to, we're not going to go that way that we're gonna get you an attorney. <laughs> so even, they even says to him, like, we're not gonna. We're not gonna call one for you. We're not. You know. You're gonna have to wait for one here. In other words, this is gonna be very, very difficult for you to achieve. So basically, what happened in this case is the same thing that happened in the other case that I worked on. He signed, and guess what happened? The interrogation proceeded. He incriminated himself. He confessed. This was appealed at the Supreme Court level at the state. I worked in this case. Uh, they wanted a motion to suppress. Because what happens when these cases are appealed is that the attorneys, what they want is the confession to be thrown out. Many times, as you all know, in the States, most cases are plea dealt, even at, in, even at the appeals level. So what happened is that they appealed for a lower sentence. So the person had already been sentenced, I think, for 40 years in prison, and they reduced it, I think, to 20 after I submitted my report. They, the judge said that that invocation for counsel was equivocal. Can I get an attorney? In other words, ambiguous. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> and all these things you watch, you look at them and you're like, I cannot believe these things when you hear these police interrogations, but they're, they're actually difficult to hear. Okay, so what happened with not defining what is an unequivocal invocation for counsel? Well, the courts basically had the per se standard. Everything goes. So anything you say, even if it's, can I get an attorney, I want an attorney, it all works. Then you have the threshold standard of clarity, and this is what started all of the problems, or many of the problems. And the other one was clarification. And that doesn't work either, but it's something else that was brought in, <laughs> that was discussed by the justices at the Supreme Court level. And I'm going to show you the most, the case that really opened Pandora's box, which is Davis versus United States. So in this case of Davis, the suspect says, maybe I should talk to a lawyer. And they had a, he had already been Miranda, Mirandized, he had already been in, under questioning for a while. And the police start the dance again. The dance that I just showed you about, well, you know, do you really, what are you asking? You know, they start playing around. No, I don't, and then Davis, what does he do? He does what most suspects do. No, I don't want a lawyer, and I'll talk to you. And he ended up actually talking to the police and again providing a confession and incriminating himself. So this case, and I'm going to show you the majority opinion and also the dissenting opinion because it's, it's really key. So this one, of course, is Justice O'Connor joined by Rehnquist, Scalia, and Kennedy, who were very conservative. As you all know, Scalia in particular <laughs> was a very conservative ju justice. Have you heard of these, uh, some of them? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that I want to show you is the aspect of, that happens with most judges that are conservative. They feel that if police are put to many barriers to interview a suspect, that that's not gonna allow them to do their work. 
And if they can't do their work, then we're really not serving society well. Because they're not thinking that the police may have a vested interest in not talking and you know, basically dismissing the invocation for counseling. So they actually, in their decision, they say that, and I wanted to highlight it here, if we were to require questioning to cease if a suspect makes a straight statement that might be a request for an attorney, this clarity in these application would be lost, the application of allowing the police basically to do their work. Now we look at the continuation of this, which is actually what I just said about the police, which is great. I love this, <laughs> this part of the data. That's why I wanted to include it here. He says, but we decline to adopt a rule requiring officers to ask clarifying questions. If the suspect's statement is not an ambiguous or unequivocal request for counsel, the officers have no obligation to stop questioning him. So in other words, we don't need to ask for clarification. We don't want to interfere in the process. We just need the police to do their work. This is, in summary, what the justices are saying. Now we have Souter join, and we have a little bit more. I think I'm going to go a little bit further here to show you the dissenting opinion. Okay. I think it's here. I'm sorry. Yes. Basically, here what they're saying is that we want you to rule sensibly. So we don't want to ask suspects to speak with the discrimination of an Oxford Don. don. What we want is to, to have good police practice. So what Ginsburg Black, you know, Ginsburg is pretty uh, liberal, uh, Justice and Stevens as well. What they wanted to say is, you know, ask clarification. It's not that difficult. It might assist in the process. You may know this is what the suspect wants to do. And they thought that it would be better to have some, some ways of restraining the police. Because in part of it, this is a very long ruling. In part of the ruling, they talk about the coerciveness, the inherent coerciveness of police interrogation. So they're like, you know, maybe we need to ask clarifying questions to the suspects because they may not have the sophistication. And I'm going to add, talk to you about some of those points. Not only here, but that have been investigated in forensic linguistics further. So, one, the suspects that are less educated and have little understanding of legal procedures. Two, vulnerable populations. We have non-native speakers of English, speakers of non-standard English, for example, African-American vernacular English, children, victims of sexual assault, individuals with cognitive disabilities. This is a whole world on its own that's been studied in forensic linguistics. Limit police power, use of coercive interrogation tactics and false confessions. This is a real issue in the legal system, and I'm sure you've watched multiple shows that talk about, but you've seen them a lot on Netflix, have like a million shows about confessions. Haven't you seen them lately? Like, okay. According to the Innocence Project, more than one out of four people wrongfully convicted but later exonerated by DNA evidence made a false confession or incriminating statement. Now, dismissing a suspect's invocation does not necessarily lead to a false confession. However, dismissing an invocation in the aim of thwarting Miranda guarantees <coughs> basically does do that. It coerces. It is coercive. It extracts a confession from a suspect and that can result in a false confession. So it's, think of it as that domino effect. If we do not accept the invocation, even though that does not necessarily lead to a false confession, it is the beginning of that possibility of happening, especially if it's coercive. And many interrogations are coercive. And I'm going to show you a couple of things. I'm going to go here a little bit faster because I don't want to spend a lot of time on this aspect. But I want to show you the issue of unequivocal and equivocal so you can see it. And those of you who are in English, I know you're doing anthropology. Did you take any anthropological linguistics or linguistics courses? Okay. So these types of invocations are the ones that most justices would say these are not, you know, unequivocal. If you would say, get me an attorney. I want an attorney. In a police interrogation, most justices, even the conservative ones, would say, that's okay. That counts. They might say bad timing. They might still give you another reason, but at least the invocation will count. These are considered speech acts, and they are considered <coughs> conventional ones. In other words, we all understand their meaning. We don't need to go through any deep process of trying to understand what they mean. We know that if someone says, open the door, you want them to open the door, and it's a direct request. OK, and that's what I meant here with the pro forma. It's a little pro forma meaning and that's the intent. It's not to be taken seriously if I, said to some, if I say to someone, for example, can I open the door? 
which would be more indirect, those are the ones that many judges consider unequivocal. Not most, the most conservative ones in certain areas of the country would say, like in the case that I worked on, it was in Guadalajara, <coughs> they would say that's equivocal, but they're really very performant. If someone asks you, can I open the door? Are you really thinking, if you're asking, would you be like, oh, do I have the ability to open the door? No, you would open the door. And that's what performance is. And if I ask you, can I get an attorney? That's what I mean. I mean, I want an attorney. These are a number of cases, and most of these that you see, the ones that are somewhat indirect, that are not in the get me an attorney type, those have all received by more liberal judges. And this is key here because I'm also studying that. I'm going to study all types of invocations for counsel and I'm going to look at all of the justices who appointed all of those justices because I'm going to compare all of that. I want to see if it falls during clear, you know, liberal, moderate, or conservative justices. I'm going to look at all of the states. I want to see if the south is different, if the northeast. I want to see all of that. But as you can see, these were pretty liberal judges. And they accepted things like, I think I should get an attorney, I want to pull an attorney. In Georgia, in that particular area where the judge was, the one where can I get an attorney was considered equivocal. These rulings have considered them unequivocal. Now we have the non-conventional means. Oh, I'm sorry. These are the ones that are a little bit, that might require some inference. So for example, if I say it's hot in here, this is just to give you an example that's not legal. A lot of you might say, well, I need to turn the AC on because it's hot. Many of you, how, well, how would you interpret that? Actually, I'm curious. To me, it would be like, oh, yeah, oh, yes. Some of you might say, yeah, it's really hot, and you might agree, but some of you might go and get up and open the window, or you might <laughs> turn the AC or something like that. That's what probably I would do. But that there could be a little bit of that ambiguity, but there's still the possibility of that duality in me. And then we have the ones that are in the think and should category. Should I call an attorney? You think I need an attorney? Those would also be indirect and non-conventional. But they all have the I there, which is key. Now, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is the issue that some people have asked me, well, why be indirect? Why would a person that has so much at stake in a police interrogation use something that's indirect and could be considered equivocal, right? And basically dismissed by the police and by the judges. Well, there are a couple of things. It's a matter of face. There's this, and it has been studied in sociology, so if any of you have taken class in sociology, you might be aware of the issue of face, and, um, or the issue of minimizing face. And we use, you talk about that all the time. Oh, you know, you don't want to threaten someone's face, or that might be face-threatening. That, in other words, it's, going, it's impolite. It's something you don't want to do. Well, think about the context of a police interrogation. And you have, to, you have to put yourself in the in the place of a suspect, basically, and what that process is. You don't know what's going on, you're a suspect. It's very threatening, so. So if you have a right to counsel laid out in Miranda, but as a lay person, you're not sure how that legal process works, or if it's even in your best interest. So remember that. As the saying goes, people who have nothing to hide have nothing to fear. And they say that, police officers say that all the time during confessions. And just confess and tell the truth. You know, why don't you say it? Get it out of your system. I've heard all those things in police interrogations. But face management is a motivating force of individuals, such as a suspect or a lay person that doesn't know any of this, to employ politeness. And also, and this is very important, and I think I have it, um, let's see. It's probably a little bit further because I'm, I'm trying to move a little bit faster, I'm sorry. I'm going to leave it there. The English language is actually, by nature, a very indirect language. As you all know, if we go somewhere, we don't ask people, pass me that, unless you know them, right? We tend to use indirectness often. It is part of the cultural aspects of the language. So asking someone in a police interrogation who's in a coercive setting to be direct doesn't make any sense. Not only for an English speaker, it doesn't make sense, but in the context, it doesn't make absolutely any sense. So. The suspect thinks this is a context where I definitely need to be polite because I do not want the police officer to get mad at me to think that I'm being disrespectful in any way. There's also the issue of indirectness, which is addressed as well, not so much in the, in the theory and face, but it's also addressed in the people that study politeness and pragmatics. And they say, well, you might not want to make the wrong move. So you might be in, being indirect, not necessarily because you're trying to be polite, but because you're trying to avoid 
making the police officer uncomfortable or feel that you are disrespecting the law, right? So there are many reasons, more reasons than to use a direct strategy, to use an indirect strategy. So this is something that sometimes we don't think, we say, oh, I should just say, get me an attorney. And that's what you should do, by the way. But, but it's not what's instinctual as an English speaker. As an English speaker, we're going to be, can I get an attorney? You're not going to say, get me an attorney to a cop in a police station when he's in your face. And it's very, it's, it is like that. If you've seen any of these shows, that's how it is. That is it's not pleasant at all. Interrogations are not pleasant processes, discursively or of any other type. Now, one of the things that I found very interesting with Solon and Tiersman, who actually, Solon, Larry Solon, a yeah, teacher at the Bro uh, Brooklyn Law School, by the way, and he has a center there, the Cognitive Center of Linguistics, Law and Linguistics. And he says that there's this double standard with police that can be very indirect with you, yet you are supposed to be direct with them. So I really like the, the issue of clarity, the degree of clarity, because he talks about it in his book about uh, in, the, in the area where he discusses police interrogations. And it is true. Police interrogations may be very indirect with you when they're stopping you at a light, when they are talking to you in a police uh, interrogation room, but they expect you to speak with complete clarity and complete direct. Let me move a little bit because I want to have time for the Q&A, so I'm trying to move a little bit fast. Okay, so I'm going to show you first a case that I think is really interesting. I try to pick these cases so that you can see a little bit the stance of the justices and how they they basically, um, depending on their, if they're liberal or if they're conservative, how they are going to interpret the law. Okay, thank you. So this is one of the cases where, number one, the petitioner invoked his right to counsel during custodial interrogation. They purported waiver of counsel for ineffective according to the police. And there was an error in admitting petitioner's statements. And the justices actually said it was not harmless. So I want you to look at this stance here so you can see this is a pretty egregious one. But he says, do you understand those rights? I want to read it because I just want you to take you through it so you can feel it. Do you want to give up the right to remain silent? Mary, do you want to talk to us about this incident? Can I get an attorney right now, ma'am? Pardon me? You can have an attorney right now? Uh, you can have one appointed for you, yes. Well, like, right now, you got one? We don't have one here, no. There's not one present now. There will be one appointed to you at the arraignment. Whether you can afford one, if you can, one will be appointed to you by the court. All right? I'll talk to you guys. Okay, you want to talk to us without a lawyer here, right? Because they want to get that right. Because then they go to the judge, and if the judge is conservative, they're going to say, no, we asked him if he wanted to talk to us. We clarified this. No, I'm saying this is what happens. And then they're going to say, if, you, if the judge is conservative and they don't go through the whole process, they're going to say, yeah, the police acted accordingly. <laughs> okay. So this is an opinion. I'm going to show you two sides of it. And this is actually in disagreement to the judges that ruled and said that they act, this was appealed, so they affirmed. And this is the, this was in the reversal of that. He says, we disagree with the district court's conclusion that the officers clearly believe that petitioner was merely asking clar clarifying questions regarding his right to counsel and answered those questions in good faith. The recorded statement taken subsequent to this invocation of his right to counsel should have been suppressed under Edwards. The confessions were central to his conviction and their admission was not harmless. But if you don't have this judge that will reverse that and you have another type of judge, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to affirm the prior, the prior court's decision and you're going to be, let's say you are already in jail, you're just trying to uh, basically throw out that confession out, that's not going to happen. And you're just going to spend more time in jail. Now I want to show you something very quickly, and I want to talk about this uh, because this is what I talk in my book and what I'm going to be looking at also with the ACLS. And it's the retaking. There are a couple of things that are going on here, and I'm just going to close now. These are the, the last slides that I have to show you very quickly. The retaking is the most used interrogation technique by law enforcement in the United States. Now, in the 20s, around, you know, before the 1940s, in the U.S., we had what was called the third day, where people were actually beaten up. That was considered illegal. <laughs> the, the Supreme Court, they had a number of rulings that said, of course, that is 
only going to lead to false confessions, so we do not want to have that type of uh, interrogation practice. So then Reed developed this psychology-based method that was supposed to get a confession, but in a humane way, where you there's a lot of assumptions that the police officers make based on their body language. You know, the suspect, you know, starts twirling their fingers or starts moving around or it seems shifty somehow. And of course, the police officers already are trained to believe that the suspect is going to be lying and you know trying to get out of the confession. So this is the point here. During this process, the interrogator must distort the suspect's perception of the situation, namely by making confession appear to be more advantageous. And I'm actually going to show you some examples of actual cases that I worked on. And this is one where you do minimization. This is not used as often by the police with the read method. But what it does is it tries to make it seem like it's not so bad. Talk to us. You know, we understand. So this is a terror. This is a really. This is a case where the suspect actually shot and murdered people in the family. So I'm not saying that there's not an issue, of course, that the person committed a crime. So I want to be clear about that. The problem is you have to abide by people's rights. The law, though, as you saw in the presentation, and I know these are very dense topics. I know because I'm studying them, and I have to spend hours reading these things. <laughs> A number of times. Linguistics is, is dense by itself, and language of the law is very dense. <laughs> but as you can see, the law gives so much leeway to the police, just by the way it is, that they can use uh, techniques like read, which has minimization, and I'm going to show you the next one, maximization. Now, this is the most common one that I see in police interrogations, which is coercion. This is basically putting it to you in a way where you have to tell me. You gotta tell me right now. You gotta tell me. It's the only moment. I'm not gonna help you after this. And that's how they say. They just say, I'm not gonna help you. You have to talk to me now. And it sounds that dire. And of course, if you're a late person, you have no idea that that's not necessarily something that you have to do right now, that you do have rights. But if you're in a police interrogation room, you will feel the pressure. You will definitely feel the pressure. And police officers, in this case, they didn't lie, but I have seen police interrogations because it is legal in some, you know, there are some limits, but it is legal in the United States to lie to, the, to for police officers to lie to suspects to get information. Many times what they do is with evidence. They tell you, look, your buddy, you know, let's say they were in a group. Oh, he confessed. He said that you were involved, that you did this and that, or we have the murder weapon, and they don't have it but they can say all these kinds of things in a way to get you to talk. And one of the things that I was, in another presentation that I gave to a law school and with the, uh, I had some criminologists in the group, and they all started talking to each other because of course they all, this is what they work on, this is their field, and he, one of the criminologists was saying, you know, it's just, it is, if, if we change the, uh, the methods of police interrogation, and there are better ones. In Europe and Canada, there are methods called the peace method of interrogation. And that method is supposed to be to not elicit false confessions. It's supposed to be an interview. The re technique the police officers talk about 80 to 90% of the time. You barely hear suspects talk in a police interrogation in the United States. In the peace method, it's more supposed to be interviewing style. So the suspect is supposed to talk. In many places, lying is illegal. In Australia, for example, you cannot lie to a suspect. It's considered illegal. So many things that we have here are not allowed in Europe, for example, or in Australia. And, and when I go to conferences, they will look at us in the States and they say, why are you going to get your act together? Why are you going to start doing things like we do in Europe with peace, for example? And you can, if you are interested, you can just put peace model of interrogation if you want to compare them with we. And you can see how you know the differences between one and the other. Or you can watch a little bit of a detective, PBS <laughs> detective, uh, one of those that they have. There's so many of them right on TV. But you can watch one of those exchanges that they have with the suspect in England, and you will see what I'm talking that is much more communicative and interview style. So you can see the difference, and then watch one in the confession tapes, next book, next book set of the confession tapes, and you can see it and hear a lot of confessions. Just so you can see how to compare one and the other. The other issue, too, is the law. And this is one of the criminologists said. He said, as long as police officers can get away with it, because the law allows them. And as I showed you, the law allows it, because the law does not define 
what is an invocation for counsel. That's unequivocal. It doesn't define, is there's a lot of ambiguity of the booking question, the pre-waiver, the post-waiver. So it gives a lot of room to police. And again, the political aspects of the bench also have a lot to do with it. Because the more conservative judges are going to use the Davis ruling almost always. Whereas the more liberal judges are going to say, no, you know, maybe, maybe that confession, you know, it should have been suppressed. Maybe it should have been clarified. Some other avenue should have been explored by the police. It was too coarse. So there's a lot of issues here. It's not the police just, just doing these things out of nowhere. You know, there is an institutional issue. It's also an issue of quotas. Police officers, detectives, they get 10 cases, and they're told, you know, clear and clear and fast, you know, you'll get promoted, and after you clear the 10, you're going to have 10 more waiting for you, especially in bigger cities where there's a lot of crime. So there's that incentive. And there's a lot of issues that we have in this country of expediency. Things have to be done fast because we want to say, you know, we're tough on crime, we're taking care of things. Then the police provides evidence to the district attorney's office. They're, they are basically... Um, elected officials. So they have this responsibility to the community. Oh, we're hard on crime. We're making sure that that person that committed the crime did it. You know, I think of the Central Park Five. There's going to be this miniseries actually uh, coming out, I think on Netflix pretty soon. And, uh, and as you, those of you who might remember the, you know, there was that expediency issue and the, the wrong people basically were interviewed, interrogated, and charged with a crime. So it's not that a crime, a crime happened. And some of the people that, that are interrogated did commit these crimes. So it's not about that. It's not that the police get that necessarily wrong. It's the process that needs to be revisited and that needs to be looked into deeper into what to do. But as long as the laws are the way they are, the interrogation methods that we use. Actually, I found in some work that I was doing in a case that empathy was very effective. And empathy is actually used somewhat in the peace method, but it's never given enough time. Police officers always go back to coercion like this. They do the empathy a little bit, and then the person starts talking. And then the moment they just can't wait, the moment they, they start talking and they're not giving them the confession, they go back to coercion. So it's kind of like the default, <laughs> and it's the most common that you're going to see, even though it's not as effective, and it can be thrown out later because it was coerced or because other things are found later in the case. So to move forward, I just want to summarize the role of justices, again, the political aspects that need to be looked at because the law needs to be looked at and the judges need to be a part of this process. We have all talked about it in conferences about how do we make changes. Well, we need to reach the judges, but reaching judges is very difficult. And they, you know, they not always lead, lead, you know, read articles or books about these topics or law reviews even. So. And then we have in the need for alternative interviewing techniques like these. We also have the issue of vulnerable suspects. In the book, in England, they have, they discuss this because they're very interested in dealing with aspects of children, persons that are sexually assaulted, uh, people that are more disenfranchised. So we have all these areas that are, need to be discussed as well. And one of the ones that is very important is the video recording of all police late person exchanges and interviews. Why? Because that's not done across the board in the United States and in many parts. Now, if you're lucky, and that's what they do in most cases, is audio recording, but it's not video recording. Now, why is video recording important? Because of many studies that have been done with multi-modality. They're done in England. Uh, I have some colleagues that do that kind of work. I haven't seen a lot of work here still. There probably are some people working on that. But the suspect is, and the, that, that dance can be linguistic, but it can also be done with body language. And that body language can be used to fix the narrative. If you do like this, or if you like really, or you move the head. All those types of body uh, movements are not captured in audio. And sometimes, not all of the interviews are, sometimes you only get, let's say you're working in a case, they only have the third part of the interview, they don't have the first or the second. So there's so many aspects, really, that need to be addressed. Will they be addressed? I don't know. I'm not always, you know, I, I, we always try to be hopeful, because we're doing research in the field, and we want to do this. but. I don't know, it's so complicated, it's extremely complicated, so. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for being here tonight, thank you. I love that one of your examples was, it's so hot in here. It's never hot in this room. <laughs> I realize I look like I'm, I'm piecing out, but actually it's just very cold in here. 
Um, this is incredibly uh, informative and, yes, incredibly complicated. And I, I think you've done such a great job of clarifying and so much of it already. And especially for, I, I, I must admit that I'm actually, I have been watching all the shows. I know that it, it's kind of, it, it's now making it easier right now. <laughs> no, now I'm like, I think I actually need a full-on, like, veg out session and marathon watch some of these things. But I mean, I, I guess it's, um, if you'd like to take a seat, by the way, you've been standing all the time, so. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, uh, but it's interesting that you mention that because there, there's, I mean, there's a very long history, right, of, of, um, of courtroom settings as, as theater, yeah. um, and, uh, and the, that performative aspect of it, um, Kafka, right, the absurdist, <laughs> is the way, and then you know, bringing in the dramaturgy, of course, is, is the way that um, language is, is, it can betray you, it does something different, it, you know. Anyway, I'm being very vague on that on that front. No, 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 very, no, no. There's so many things that have been very thought provoking about this, um, and so I just have a couple of, of questions. But aside from that, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'd like to open it up. Um, so uh, one one thing that that came to mind uh, for me um, is uh, I think when you mentioned was it. No, nothing to nothing to hide, nothing to fear, right? Yeah. And so, um, one question I guess I have uh, has to do with whether you've seen uh, a shift in in the, the problems that you're studying, uh, a spike maybe post 9/11. Because one thing that that I think has come to the fore uh, is the intense militarization. Of, of local police forces. Um, and I think that that really became quite stark uh, when Black Lives Matter uh, happened, when there were protests, uh, you know, uh, Michael Brown, Trayvon mm -hmm. Martin. Um, and all of a sudden, we were seeing the images of, of these tanks that were actually <laughs> not within regulation for, for little small town roads. Yes. Or any road, any just urban environment. They're not meant for urban environments. Um, they're not meant for human beings, but that's aside from the point. There are four tanks, which is horrible. But in any the case, case <laughs> right? But it's, but it's just that post 9/11, 9/11 changed so much of the way uh, language works for us, mm -hmm. and, and how I think, and what I, you know, public opinion is about justice, even and language, right? Because we had you know, Donald Rumsfeld saying, "What was it? Uh, we have the known knowns and the known unknowns, right?" Oh, yeah. And uh, and the Patriot Act, the fact that we you know the nothing to fear, nothing to hide, is, is now the definition of patriotism itself. Um, and so, I guess I wanted to ask you a bit uh, about that, and whether that's been a you know, language is a very yeah. powerful tool, and unfortunately, we don't talk about it enough. You see it on CNN, you know, I see people talking. Oh, you know, as we know, with all the politics today, and they seem to you know false news and all these things that we've been seeing all the time in the news. And of course, the narrative of you know when we were during that time of 9/11, you know, evil, us yes. versus them. We have all this discourse, and that studied a lot in critical discourse analysis, and particularly studies the political aspects of language. And um, to to look at in terms of the police interrogation, I would say that in those contexts in particular, because the laws were actually they were a little bit different. I think that in those cases, I believe that they were somewhat outside of the laws that protected us. Because I think that was with the Patriot Act and some things like that. So right. that, and that was pretty, um, getting access and to know these things a little bit more, that wasn't really, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to address because I'm thinking about my colleagues who right. do more work also in England and things like that. I just don't right. think there was really access for us to look at those types of interrogations. We did find out later about the waterboarding right. and all these other courses. I, I would think giving the more, the more, behind the doors it is, the more the odds of then coercion and the less of the legal protections, the more coercive mm -hmm. is going to be. And I suspect in some cases, I do not know firsthand, but when we heard the waterboarding and things like that, I suspect then the, the things that were not allowed here about the third degree, physical third degree, then became allowed. And the issue of false confessions then can come into play mm -hmm. because there's so many studies that have shown that that type of way of getting information from an is in effect at a psychological level. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what the people in the Peace Project, the people that work on Peace, there are a lot of them are forensic psychologists because they understand this process that, that is that actually interviewing a suspect is more effective. Mm -hmm. 
and not forcing the suspect. And I saw that in my cases. It's just that it didn't, I, they didn't give it enough time for me to see the effectiveness of it. But I would see that with the coercion, when they started the coercion, which is the most popular tactic, it was the most ineffective in getting information. Because then the person would just start saying, no, no, they denied, they denied, they denied, they denied, and they didn't want to talk. The few instances where I saw the person become more human and talk and relate to the police officer was when they were being the, the minimization technique. The one who was more, oh, you know, I, I would be the same if this happened to me. Of course, the problem is if you're lying, then we have that issue. But it's allowed in the law, so in some instances. So that's yeah. it's such a complex, it's a very right. complex issue. But language is at the center of all these things. And I always, I talked about it sometimes at conferences, you know, why don't they call us? You know, when they, when they talk about yeah. these things, they don't. They always call someone, I don't know, a, a, an economist or something, I don't know. But they tend to not talk, sometimes talk about people in the humanities or even someone in sociology or, you know, psychology, forensic psychologists, they tend to ignore us. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I guess it's, it's that kind of thing that I, and yeah. why I bring up my love is because it feels, at least during my life, I'm sure since probably the Enlightenment, really, the idea of language is completely transparent. Right, makes it such that the idea is the word is there. There's no, there's no question about it. And so the the linguist who actually has much more information about what's really going on with it, it's kind of you know it's it's overlooked in that scenario. But um, I, I just want to ask one oh, follow up please, question, please but then but then I'm definitely going to open up. But I guess um, I think uh, thank you so much for for that response. By the way, um, uh, one. Question, another question, I guess, that, that kind of builds on that is, I guess, um, and kind of tacks onto the 9-11 ideas. I guess I'm asking um, a little bit outside of the group, kind of broadening out a bit, but how much of you know, the aspirations of you and your colleagues depend, in a sense, on uh, public opinion and, and what the public's idea of justice is right now? Because that's what has been polarized, I think, in, with this very Manichaean kind of like good cop, bad cop, good, good and evil. That's, you know, yeah. in, in that, that kind of imperative. There's more of the issue of expediency that yes, I talked about, right. of the we got to get this right and we got to get it fast, and I'm sorry, that we got to get it fast and not necessarily right. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the issues, and we have that in our politics, we have in our society, if you look in history, and I don't, I don't want to delve a little in areas that I'm not an expert, but some, you know, if you look at documentaries about the wars, for example, every, things have to be done fast. There's this issue in, that we tend to, I think historically, everything has to be done expediently, like it has to be done now. <laughs> And I think that has definitely taken us down a lot of wrong roads, bad roads, if you will. I have talked to actually to police officers who tell me, so many of them who then became academics later, like forensics, uh, they do like CSI kind of things and teach. They say, you know, I used to do interrogations. They go to conferences and they say to me, you know, we felt bad afterwards. We felt like we went too far. But that's what they told us to do. And I know sometimes you think like, well, you know, but you don't have to. But it's just, it's presented as a good way of interrogating, you know, people, the read techniques. So they are doing their job, they think it's, it's you know, and, and as I said, some of these people, not all of them, there are, we do know that some people confess and they might be innocent. And we do know many cases like that. But a lot of people also have committed the crime. So there's this kind of, it's, it's a difficult, it's difficult. Because in some ways, you want people that have committed crimes to, you know, to serve, you know, the, you know, the justice to be served in that way, but you also want to make sure that people's rights are protected and that people that are innocent don't go, you know, serve time that they don't deserve to serve. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something, and I see that in the narrative of many things, and I, and I think when you talk about the 9-11, I, I remember seeing that little bit, that narrative, that everything is the, the urgency, everything has to be done. We have to take care of this. And we tend to frame things as us versus them, and that's done a lot. In many countries, that has done the us versus them, and we are sort of the good people, or we are the ones that are law abiding, they are the non law abiding. Yeah. And we see it sometimes in the narrative of some cases that we have seen recently um, in Ferguson and different cases where how people are framed mm -hmm. and the media is part of the problem. I mean, I'm, and the media, in the sense of like discussing the topic in a certain way, and because everybody. This is something I learned in, in linguistics as studying discourse analysis. We're all biased. There's none, no person, no media outlet, none of them is completely unbiased. That's not possible. We're all shaped by our, we have what we call shared knowledge and also background knowledge. We're all shaped by our experiences and by our collective experiences. And all those shape how we speak and how we use language. So 
um, it's very, like, of course, some are going to be in a bias in a way that we don't, that we find worse, right? <laughs> but, but there's always a bias. There's always a bias. Because it's inevitable. It's just part of our makeup as human beings, as, as speakers, uh, and as social beings. It's not, you know. But I understand what you're saying, and it's actually true. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your talk. At the beginning of your discussion of power, you mentioned that suspects can assert power. And I'm wondering if you can speak further about that and to give examples from your work of moments when I have been booked or interrogated. Um, you saw suspects as well. Um, I, you don't see it as often, but they can in the sense that they don't have to talk. Or they could be the suspect who will invoke counsel and will stick to their guts. Sometimes, actually, people who have a lot of experience with, the, with the, the law enforcement, law enforcement, you know, know, their, know how to deal better. I remember, and this was with courtroom interpreting, actually, not with, but I remember that the, in the cases of the narco traffickers, you know, the big narco guys, they would hire their own interpreters to make sure that the interpreters that were in the courtroom were doing their jobs. So they, they had the money yeah. and the wealth. To, yeah, they made sure that, so they had their backup <laughs> court interpreters. And I always thought that was so funny. Interpreters that I know of that worked in different federal courthouses told me, yeah, they would hire their own people and they would sit there to make sure that we were doing the right thing. And now they would tell the attorney. So it is possible for a suspect to be able to have that knowledge. The problem is a lot of people, when they go to a police station, they just don't have the knowledge. They do. No, you know, you think, oh, I have my right to remain silent, but who really knows about how that the law doesn't really work that way? Yes, you have the right to remain silent, but you have to invoke it in such a way, and you have to invoke it at the right time, and all these processes. So most suspects are going to be at a disadvantage. So power can be more easily asserted. But I, the biggest issue, because the suspects don't always don't always find that category. I would say most, but not all. But the biggest issue is that lack of knowledge. There's a total asymmetry of knowledge. And, I, and we can see that in many institutions with med, the medical field, for example. You have that asymmetry. So sometimes it's not that they're asserting power over you, it's that they assert knowledge over you. And I think that's the way to kind of frame it a little bit more. But the institutions do have power. That is true. It's not always asserted in the way that we think traditionally. Because they have to interact with you. And since there's a negotiation, in an interaction, the power cannot be asserted always and at all instances and 100%. Because then if not, there would be no back and forth. So, yeah. but it's a good question, it's true. Something I've thought a lot about, uh, why I focus on the asymmetry more and the field focuses, but I've thought a lot about the power because the question comes up a lot mm -hmm. in the talks. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you so, thank, again, thank you so much for your talk. So earlier on in your presentation, you mentioned how there were certain communities where that were particularly vulnerable to making false confessions or being could be yeah yeah um, persuaded by coercion more so. So I'm thinking more particularly of people who are on the spectrum for neurodiversity, for example, or. I guess my question is, say for example, a language barrier isn't necessarily re readily apparent mm -hmm. when a suspect first begins to interact with an officer, mm -hmm. but then as the questioning or the routine booking process mm -hmm. goes along, it becomes a little bit more, yes. maybe not obvious, but yes. there are signs, mm, like what is the officer then obligated to do? Is there any sort of guidance about that? Or can the officer then say, well, this is what the person said and yes. not necessarily read usually, into the subtext. Yeah, that's what they usually do, and that's why it's interesting because now when I look at the most uh, current cases, they actually put excerpts of the interrogations in the case summary. But the older ones, they don't. So they, they, the justices are trying to see the context more, because you have to always look at language and context. But the police, the thing is, for example, is it the language issue? Even though a person uh, that doesn't speak a, a, a language natively, is has to have the assistance of an interpreter in a court setting. A police officer in an interrogation setting can serve as an interpreter. And you can see the problems with that because there's a conflict of interest mm -hmm. and they might not be qualified. But they can't. They can you know do the interview, they can bring someone else in, oh he speaks Spanish or he speaks another language. And the person really and then they say, Well they understand, I keep asking you, you understand your rights? And he says yes. And then sometimes they say, well, we asked him his name, and he answered. And we asked him where he lived, and he answered. 
but there's an issue of proficiency and competency in the language which is, is much broader than being able to understand some of the things that the police brings up as very basic abilities. That doesn't mean that you can understand complex process as an interrogation or even Miranda. Actually, a lot of people don't understand Miranda because of the way that it's written. And as I was showing, you know, sometimes when I, I, I give these presentations, I say, you know, there is dense, and you can see it in the cases, you can see it in everything. It's just a very dense, you know, even when you're a specialist in the field, you have to read these things multiple times because the language of the law is just not, is not clear. That's why they had that English, uh, uh, plain English movement for many years, and I don't think it's really taken on. But, <laughs> but if the, if all these processes are difficult, they're dense, and of course, then there's the issue of the police not having to necessarily cooperate or be there to protect your rights necessarily. So, and then if you don't have the right attorney later, and if this doesn't get appealed, you know, I think of all the cases that never made it to an appeal court. Because these attorneys that I worked with for these cases were criminal pilot lawyers, and many of them were pro bono. But a lot of people don't want to do that. They're not going to work, you know, they work other cases to be able to do this pro bono work. But I think of all of the ones that didn't get to have that second or third chance in the world. It's very complicated. And then the vulnerable suspects, children. There's a lot that needs to be done. This is a huge field and so much, given how much is at stake, you know, it's a person's life, it's a person's future, their destiny, you know. So, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. The last point you brought up about children, especially given, you know, the current situation where there's so many children who are currently in civil court proceedings, you know, and yes. having to be their own advocate, interpreter, <coughs> defender, everything. Um, but I was wondering, I had a similar question to Amy's actually about kind of the performative aspects of all of this, right? There's, I mean, there's a performance in the, in the interrogation itself mm -hmm. where the police officers have so much more information and knowledge about you know, how this will hold up under the law or in yeah. a courtroom, court of appeals. Yeah. Um, and so they're actually using this kind of language that's trained, that's not natural, that's a performance in and of itself, right? And then you have this additional layer of performance if it's recorded just audio or if it's video recorded. Um, and then furthermore, you have Netflix and you have the yeah. popular representations of it. And I was thinking, how do these people even know ask for a lawyer even indirectly and that's because of TV I don't know how someone would know otherwise right you see you're under arrest you have the right to remain silent can I get a lawyer like that's just you've seen it so many times you don't yeah. even know which movie it came from and, <laughs> yeah. you know and so I think I'm starting to think um, a little bit about um, what it what are the ways in which these performative aspects might be harnessed um, for to kind of close that knowledge gap or information gap, right? Like if people are getting their information and knowledge from TV, what is the potential role of theater and performance yeah. in in spreading knowledge about what your rights are? Because you know nobody's like very few people, even specialists, as you say, are going to actually read the the letter of the law and know what the Edwards case says versus yeah. the Miranda, you know. Yeah. But what you have to know isn't even that. It's 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 what you're supposed to say. And you know, you gave us very valuable information. <laughs> and you say, "Get me a lawyer," you know, which is so. <laughs> and don't do it anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, hard. Get me a lawyer. That's it. And that's hard because sometimes they walk out the room and they leave you there for three hours, mm -hmm. and you're like, "Oh my God, I better." I better talk now because I can't stand being in this room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very difficult, and you have to hold your. <laughs> you have to just say, "Okay, I'm gonna keep saying, give me a look." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering about all these diff different kind of layers of performativity, and and if there's if it always has to be you know negative, or if there's you know especially in these video recordings, if there's kind of like a positive potential for it. Um, I just kind of like as an aside, I'm thinking of a video I watched at one point of someone who was. Um, being arrested very much. They were trying to put handcuffs on him. He was down on the floor and his partner was videotaping this and narrating it and that's an interesting other like level of kind of narrating what's going on so it's not just the dialogue and those voices. And as soon as they finally got the handcuffs on him, she switched to Spanish and she said like, stop, it, it's done. You know, like stop resisting. 
and that was also recorded. Her switching, she was speaking in English for the audience who might, you know, see this video, and then suddenly she was speaking to the actual person in a different language. So anyway, it's just something that happens to me. You know, and one of the things, I think that's really important to put it out there. I, I want, I'm one of those persons, when I'm working in these cases, I tell them, I want to hear the entire interrogation, which is difficult, and that's the only thing I fear, is sometimes we get these things a little bit digested, and we get just a clip of it, or a part of it, and we don't get the whole thing. And you need the whole thing, you really do. Even though some things might be, that you might just say, okay, those 30 minutes, really nothing happened, but you need it because if you just show me that part, and it's the only thing that I'm concerned sometimes is when I see that because we all again have a little bit of our biases and we are going to submit or present what we think was the thing that bothered. And that's, that's fine, I mean, that's a human reaction. But um, I think there's, there needs to be more where we are presented with things from that broader perspective and maybe have more of a discussion about these things. And I started thinking, how could we do that? Should we do that at the K-12 level? Should we do it in college? I mean, I've been thinking about these things so that we can have that knowledge be out there a little bit more. And language and the law in the States, it, I mean, it started probably in the 80s. There were already books out there. Roger Shy of Georgetown did a lot of work. And Solon, which is at Brooklyn Law School, he's done a lot of work there. A lot of the big work is done in Europe, honestly, um, in forensic linguistics. They have MAs and PhD. Hofstra actually has an MA. Very small. So it's something that I think needs to be more out there, and maybe in an easier ways, and not just take a for instance that was class, but just so that people understand the law and the process. It would be great if this changed. But I keep going back to what that criminologist, professor of criminology, told me. You know, he's like, the law has to change. Because I sometimes think, well, maybe the interrogation would change the tactics a little bit. We get out of read, that might help. But again, the law has to change. The law has to change. But how do we do that? How we do that if we can't reach the justices and if there's a little bit of the political aspects of the bench too. As we all know, that's a big issue. Although that's why the sorry, Supreme Court yeah. is so important. A lot of people say, well, who can no, mm -hmm. it matters a lot. Yeah. Although just to clarify, as as you mentioned, Edwards was actually the fault. it was a law change. Um, in addition, or it was supplementing on to on top of Miranda. Yeah. yeah. And so it becomes this yeah. How many, how many laws will need to change over, you know? <laughs> and when I show you Davis, yeah. a lot of the rulings, even when they go all the way up, if it's a conservative bent, you know, group of, that are going to be uh, affirming, you know, with the majority, if they, they can go with Davis and say, well, you know, they didn't need to clarify. It was equivocal. Even though it really linguistically, this is what I always say. This, when the first, when the police, when the uh, attorneys came to me to work with me, they said, you know, can we, can, I need to, can you write me a report? Because, you know, lawyers, they just come to you and they say, write me a report and tell me that this is, you know, not equivocal. When I looked at it as a linguist, I said, I don't, how, why is this even an issue? This is not equivocal. Can I get a lawyer is a request, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, this is not, it's not, yes, it's formulated in directness, but that indirectness and equivocalness is, are two separate things. The law is the one that conflated them when they created these standards because the Miranda Networks didn't have them, so they didn't specify. And actually, the, the way that it would be best, but then, of course, for many reasons, is that per se standard, which is you say anything that you know sounds like you want an attorney and the interrogation stops. But as we know, that is not what the system, for many reasons, you know, what we have with the reasoning and the law, the other laws, you know, really support. So that's when all these other Davis and other rulings came into play that really mucked everything up, <laughs> to be honest. Because it, it's not equivocal. When you say, can I get a lawyer, or I want a lawyer, you know, I think I want a lawyer, you're asking for an attorney. Mm -hmm. There's, that's it. And I, I always found that interesting that as a linguist, I couldn't understand the issue. That's when I started then digging, and I started looking at the law, and I said, this is where the problem started. They created an issue where there's no linguistic issue. <laughs> And, and even in some cases, even if there's a pragmatic duality where there could be two possible meanings, you know, it still doesn't mean that it's, you know, not a request. I've actually seen cases where the judges say it's not even a request. It's not because it's indirect. It's so indirect that it's not a request because they still think that indirectness negates a request. So it's, it's so difficult, but then if you can't reach that audi audience, the one that's making these rulings, it's very difficult to make changes. So, yeah, I mean, in the, 
in a sense, it was <coughs> just thinking of what, what you just mentioned uh, with performa, and uh, clearly this is what this meant. Yeah. Like even if it wasn't stated that way, but it's almost you're uh, dealing in, in, in the case of that interaction with two different kinds of statistical imaginaries, right? You have the police who's already, and, and unfortunately I think the public too, so in, when it's more pro-police, has a statistical imagination of who is guilty. And you know, mm -hmm. the, these are vulnerable populations mm -hmm. that unfortunately have become quite conflated with, you know, for, forget about innocent until proven guilty. It's, you know, <laughs> there's a statistical imagination there, unfortunately. Um, and what you're trying to do, in a sense, in my interpretation at least, please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is with the pro forma, um, aspect at least to say there's the statistics to the likelihood of this meaning this and it's a really high statistical yes. likelihood but it seems like that statistic just does not matter as much as this other one mm -hmm. um, which and it will yeah. depend on and yeah. again if this doesn't get appealed mm -hmm. you know the police because of how they're trained they're going to they want what you want is a confession that is the whole purpose of the interrogation it's not to get information it's to get a confession that's what the read method of interrogation is about. So they don't really have a vested interest in doing this just because that's their training. So just, just to put it that way. Mm -hmm. So unless the case gets appealed or something like that happens and they get the right judge mm -hmm. that will look and say, no, can I get an attorney? It is an unequivocal invocation. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. Then it's not going to work. And we're not really going to know, yeah. you know, did this person get the right type of decision? So it's very problematic, and it's it's something that you know can keep you up at night sometimes yeah. <laughs> you know, when you think about it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm impressed you know about all the different shows right now that are based on this because I'm hoping that you're not watching them. You need a break, right? <laughs> like you're actually following through, watching them. Oh my god! Yes, yes, yes. so, yes. it's, it's, yeah, it's just you see them. And I'm like, oh, yeah. that looks interesting. And the confession tapes are pretty interesting, but again, everything is going to be sort of digested from the perspective of the people that are making the documentary. So, you know, there's a lot of good there, but when you look at these things, you always have to look at them in a very, you know, sort of critical way just to, because you can, you can, as you all know, you make a documentary, you can always take somewhat aside or another. It is, it's just how it is, but this, it doesn't mean there's not a lot of value in it. There is, there's a lot of good things there. But it's interesting though, because now I'm thinking about it, the, the, and to kind of build off Alex's point too about um, the, the performance and the media in which we've been seeing this, but the history of Miranda seems incredibly tied to the history of mass media in the US. Like just the television shows and, and you know, and like that, that kind of form. And, and that, the fact that that's how we're getting uh, most of our information about legal procedure, uh, for sure. Yes, yes. And it's, it seems like there's a double bind there. Um, in the sense that while it's disseminating a lot of crucial information, it might also be contributing in some ways to a general cultural fear, which is part of what feeds, I think, public opinion to, to side with the expedient aspect. Uh, in a more dystopian, uh, what's that show? Uh, no, it was a film, Truman, the Truman Show kind of aspect. <laughs> yeah. What if we, could we possibly replace the, the expedients um, with drama, as a word, is, is one of the, the goals mm -hmm. in this now. It's not just experience, but in a sense, it's almost like there there's a desire for a kind of drama. Yeah, yeah and if justice yeah. is not the goal, we're going to have problems. And that's yes. What we see. If expediency is yeah. the goal, we're going to have a problem. If, right. if we're not necessarily going to find the right person, we're not necessarily going to do the, you know, the mm -hmm. see. But there's, and you're dealing with, you know, the intersection of justice and, and the inevitability of bias, right? And so then you were, we're talking about the objectivity of truth, which, and then, you know, how much time do you have? So. <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah. Yeah. just layer after layer, 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 layer. and, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I've been taught criminal justice for too many years. Okay. Um, if you look at the history of Miranda, which came about in 1966, mm -hmm. so approximately, the first legitimation, or at least media legitimation, was on the Dredd in 1966 series, if you go back that far, and the, the old Jack Webb series. And uh, their approach uh, laid the front, uh, framework, I think, for legitimizing how the media after that had portrayed the uh, Miranda decision and uh, law and order and criminal justice. Uh, and then I think it got uh, compounded as you had 9-11, as you had uh, the particular statements 
about super predators, about the increase in crime, going on and on. I think to the point that uh, uh, legally becomes uh, questionable in terms of all decisions now in the land ever since 1966. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you also share a little bit what the other criminologists have said, you know, the issues with more with the law, you know, with, with having, that's where we need to go at more than just changing the police to interrogation techniques and the processes. So would you, from your perspective, agree with that as well? Yeah, I would uh, go pretty far on that. Uh, it's uh, two things. First of all, it's the nature of the law mm -hmm. and how the law is interpreted and applied by the law enforcement mm -hmm. in regard to confessions. That is, uh, there are several ways of looking at this. Uh, one way of looking at this is that uh, uh, interrogators will go as uh, far as they want, figuring that most is going to get buried anyway. Maybe one out of every 100 or 1,000 cases will actually be questioned given the volume of the criminal justice system. Yes. Uh, number two, uh, as with the issue of uh, body cameras now and uh, mm -hmm. enlightening the behavior of law enforcement, uh, there'd be a question of uh, whether uh, the certainty for uh, being uh, questioned or, uh, or having the legal system uh, re-examine these particular actions of police uh, actually act as restraints. I, I don't know the answer to that really. I think it lies somewhere in the middle, probably more so that uh, more is actually uh, uh, gotten, uh, more is actually uh, uh, ignored, and uh, uh, these convictions uh, go through the system uh, to the point where you can have a whole lot of uh, innocence project kinds of uh, investigations, and you can still never hit the bottom of that. So uh, what we're saying here is rather important in terms of language too. Uh, as a case you may not may or may not know about. This goes back to New York uh, about 30, 40 years ago. So I don't know if anybody remembers anymore. <laughs> there was a shooting in New York and the uh, suspect was uh, picked up and put in back a patrol car. And uh, the officers uh, sort of uh, 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 laid the stage for the individual to incriminate themselves indirectly by saying things like, you know, it's awful, we have all the shootings all the time, the gun is out there, and uh, uh, someone else uh, might actually pick up the gun and there might be more casualties, at which point the individual then said, I know where to find the gun. It's a true story. I don't remember how it was resolved, but it's a true story. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, what, what I'm saying there, yeah, that's what you're talking about in terms of this indirect language. Yeah, it's, it's and the ones where, oh no, you're in the squad car, it doesn't count. Like, it's that booking phase, you know, the issue of getting around the booking, or it's, oh, it's pre-waiver, it doesn't, because Davis applies to post-waiver, and, and, and then there's some that are uh, charge specific. So they have this thing where, well, I have you in the in interrogation room, and then, okay, so if you your book, you're right, for this thing that I'm talking to you about, about one case, I leave the room for two, three hours, and I come back, and, but I'm talking to you about something else, and I'm like, the person starts, you know, talking to you when I start initiating a discussion on a different issue, unrelated, and then they say, well, what about Edwards? You know, you know, and it's like, no, because it's not a violation of Edwards because the, the suspect basically is, is a different charge, so we can ask him that. It has, it's not, it's Edwards, or they start talking about these laws being case-specific, and I'm like, so there's so many things. There's so many layers to, to the process that you, your head's <laughs> I just had a very brief question. What are the what are the specific words? What is the specific language that lets a suspect know that you're no longer in booking phase and now you're in interrogation it's a, phase? It's supposed to be the, the reading of the Miranda rights. Ah. Yes. Um, the you have a right to remain silent, you have a right to an attorney, which is only in criminal cases and not in civil yes. cases. And you can be quite, you can say if you're in custody you can say I'm under arrest because if you're not under arrest you don't you can leave. Uh, but they said yes you're under arrest. And, but you saw how in that case about well you've been charged with rape a person may not understand that that's being under arrest because he says am I under arrest? And he says you've been charged with rape. But you may not know this is a person who's uneducated you know didn't have a lot of back you know educational background. You may not understand that being charged with rape means that you're under arrest for rape. So. He, kept, he didn't understand the process. So there's always this game that can happen 
but yes, it's, you're supposed, once you've read your rights, uh, and you're under arrest and you read your rights, so you see all these layers and all these things that can even happen even when you know that you're supposed to do it after you've read your rights, then you're supposed to say, I, I want to turn. So you're charged with rape, that means he was or he was not under arrest? Yeah, he was under arrest. Yeah. He was. But he didn't understand it. But they just didn't answer. Because he didn't. Yeah. yeah, he didn't say you're under. Yeah, you're under arrest. I mean, he's, I he asked, asked "Am I under arrest?" Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can do. It's a game. Oh, yeah, because you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're asked. Oh, you say, "Oh, am I under arrest?" Well, you you know you've been charged with this, and if you don't know you've been charged with something, means yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are under arrest. Yeah. The police can go get you. Go get you at your house somewhere. <laughs> I guess I still don't fully understand the rationale in the read method that says that lying to a sister is okay. Like I guess I understand how it would like lead into the expediency piece of getting a confession faster, and if confession is the end, then by any means necessary, I suppose. But it's because the law allows the law to an extent. You're not you cannot lie about everything, but it allows it gives the police some leeway that they can lie about some things if it facilitates. They can say things like, oh, you know, we talked to, they can do this a lot. Oh, you know, we talked to the guy who was with you and he, he talked, he said everything. He said you were there and the guy didn't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we, I've seen ones where like, we have the, the murder weapon or we have the gun. We have it, we have it. And then you start questioning, oh my, they do. And they don't have it. But they can tell you that to get, because the law allows it. There's some leeway. They can't, you can't lie, uh, there's, there's some supposedly some limits to how much you can lie and what, you know, about what things, but you can't lie about some things mm -hmm. in a police interrogation. And that's for that, that you just asked, yeah, that would, that would fit. Yeah. But can they lie and say that, there's, that they have DNA evidence, or is that like too much of like a blatant? That might be too much, I don't, yeah, I really like don't know the extent of how much they can lie. I don't, I know that there's some limits, I don't, because that, those are going to be all case by case and, right. But um, they definitely can do that in an interrogation. And the case of minimization, a lot of time, is just to seem human. It's like, you know, if my wife would have done that to me, you know, I don't know what I would have done. Like when he was saying that, you know, if you, she would have told me that I, because he shot the wife. If you would have told me, you know, she would have told me that she was going to take my kids away. And that's what they do a lot, is that empathy, minimization. And the, the police officer doesn't look, is not really saying that. He's not empathizing at all. But he wants to be more human, see more, you know, like he understands what the other person's going through. Because that is something that as human beings, when someone's empathetic towards us, and I'm not a psychologist, but we tend to feel more comfortable and we tend to feel like we can talk to that person. And the police use that strategy because the read method says that's one of the strategies, that's one of the nine, they have the nine steps. Now police officers don't follow online, you don't have to, but it's one of the nine steps of the read technique. But I'm, in, in my cases, and, and I don't have a huge statistical set, but of the police interrogations that I would look at, coercion is the number one that they use. Mm -hmm. With time limited offers, many times. Like, you gotta tell me now, you gotta tell me now. You know, when I leave, if I leave, don't say that I didn't try to help you. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. I just, had, I just had a comment. So, back in high school, I was actually arrested and um, kind of interrogated as well, and I ended up being charged with something that I didn't do, I was charged with truancy, uh, when I should have been charged with trespassing. Uh, so just for context, I ended up streaking during a, in a baseball field, like at a stadium, <laughs> during a live MLB game, like, this is, this is like nice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I went to private school my whole life, I'd never been arrested for anything, like I, I didn't do anything, I was, like, I was a good kid, like honor society, honor all. <laughs> but next, next thing I know I'm being held in the detention center underneath the stadium, and, and you know, I was underage, so things worked a little differently in that they couldn't really, like the, not, not the situation, but the, I guess the steps they take is different for a minor and stuff. Yeah, you're a minor, yeah. yeah. So you know, the laws are completely different, but I remember you know, after I was released to my parents, my parents had to come, I was crying, she had to like <laughs> sign me out and stuff. But a few months later, so I got a call from the uh, Juvie Center or whatever saying that um, like I had like, I missed an appointment or something and that oh. I was going to be sent, you know, to court for like, however, like I was going to be sentenced or whatever. And this is information that they didn't tell me that day when they were charging and they released me. Mm -hmm. So I was able to call a local 
uh, Boys and Girls Club and uh, make arrange something for this program, mm -hmm. which kind of like alleviated or took away me having to go to court and like serve all this extra time. <laughs> so like, you like, yeah, it's like I can totally see how like not knowing this information, not having any background, and like not knowing the steps. You're a minor too. Exactly, and you know, they didn't go over it and tell me how to show up anywhere. They weren't willing to hear you out on the fact that they weren't informed. Like no one told you. No, it was just. They, they were just like. Originally, they told me that I was going to be, I was being fined by the San Diego Padres, which you know the city my, you know, streaked yeah. in. Yeah. Um, that I had a lifetime ban. That I was going to spend like two nights in county jail. That I was fined like four thousand dollars. All this other stuff. Doubt it very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then you know, once they found I was a minor, they're like, oh, we can't really do all that stuff. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, the whole process, you know, just like. I was going like a little flashback, so we like it's here in the presentation. I wanted to add something about the retake man. I have a sort of recently at Rutgers uh done policing courses. Uh, I don't know how um, how prevalent this is, but if you look at the Central Park Drive case, the police can plan inside information during interrogation, yeah. the individuals sort of begin to agree with it, where it comes out in public that they knew they were guilty because they had all this information no one else knew. Yeah. So it, it is a great form of manipulation, that they planned it during the manipulation, yes, uh, during the interrogation, yeah. rather. So uh, yeah, it, it's a form of uh, manipulation of the suspect, basically, which legitimates it, makes it look real in terms of the media, in terms of uh, further conviction. So there's a lot of stuff uh, which is implicit in the nice steps of the retail. Yeah, yeah it's the Q&A, the DeLorean case, it was one of those cases where the FBI is an old case. And Roger Shai, who is a very well-known forensic linguist from Georgetown, who's retired, he, he looked at the tapes, and one of the things was that the, the issue about the cocaine and the money, all these things that was part of the, the, that case with the FBI, they were always being brought up by the, the police officers, the law enforcement, never by DeLorean. But then because of association, because the conversation is happening between the two, that gave that appearance that he was part of it, that DeLorean knew about it, that he was confirming things, even though he never mentioned it or said anything about it. And that's the issue of also the interrogation and the thing about tainting, yeah. that you can bring something, put something there, and then the person may respond, or even not pick it up at all. It's just the fact that it's there. That's why I always, you know, the thing about being careful when we see these clips and these things that we sometimes see is that we, and it's normal, we tend to quickly try to make a, a, you know, an assessment of the situation and we don't really know the whole process of really what's going on and how that whole conversation, who started it and, and the whole process. So it's, it's very, very complex in that, but you know. But interesting, you know, now I think now when you're watching these things, you're going to be like, like it happened to me when I started getting involved with this now, I don't, you never see anything the same way. After you, when I started working on the cases, every time I would see a show that had to do with it, I started thinking about the cases that I've worked on and you start thinking about these things that way. So it's good that way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an experience. Like. so much Thank you. for sharing all of this information and for really helping us navigate um, all this. I think we can all go streaking safely now. <laughs> what we should say. Uh, so thank you again and, and um, carry on the, the good fight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you.